very good morning students in this um, lecture we will uh, look at one of the methods how we can employ the geosynthetics for reducing depth pressures so just briefly <coughs> we know that there are um, different types of earth pressures the at rest earth pressure when there is no lateral deformation in the soil active um, earth pressures when the uh, soil moves away from the from the backfill then passive when we have a compressive type of uh, deformations in the soil then of course um, apart from all these uh, three classical earth pressures we have the compaction induced earth pressures um, which are uh, um, particular for uh, different uh, cases especially uh, these uh, compaction induced stresses are critical for bridge abutments and this is how um, the um, the earth pressures are reduced to active earth pressures. Let us say that we have a retaining wall with some backfill and um, if it is um, able to, um, to uh, move laterally, let us say that it has deformed and it has um, moved out laterally and uh, because of this our uh, Rankin earth pressure uh, earth, um, rupture plane develops here along with uh, shear stress is generated on that surface and because of this um, shear resistance that is uh, trying to prevent uh, this wedge of soil from moving laterally our um, forces that are transferred into the into the retaining wall are reduced. This is the principle of the earth pressure reduction because of the development of active earth pressures and for the design purposes we normally use the active earth pressures uh, for most of the free standing retaining walls because um, uh, we need only very small amount of deformations of the order of about 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 percent of the wall height for um, achieving um, active conditions. Uh, but then uh, we also have compaction induced distresses especially against very rigid uh, bridge abutments or basement walls and so on. And here the locked in um, lateral stresses uh, because of the compaction could be highly significant especially um, for some type of soils and uh, these uh, locked in lateral stresses depend on the type of soil that we have because um, um, uh, the soils with um, higher shear strength like higher friction angle are more sensitive they have higher uh, locked in stresses then the method of compaction whether we are using uh, static rollers or uh, vibro rollers and so on. Then of course uh, the, um, the compaction pressures, the, the energy that we use for compacting the soil also um, controls the lateral stresses that we generate. And how do we achieve the active conditions? We have already seen that uh, the one simple way is allowing lateral deformation of the, the retaining wall away from the backfill and um, how much of lateral deformation do we require to achieve the active conditions is actually depends on several factors. Some of them I have listed here uh, the uh, shear strength properties of the soil obviously uh, the C and phi properties of the soil they control the magnitude of the, the uh, pressures that are um, developed and then the amount of deformation that we require. Then the modulus of the soil because um, if your soil has very high Young's modulus even small deformations will, re will um, result in um, very high uh, stress changes. And then the mode of wall deformation there are uh, three different um, identifiable uh, modes of deformation for rigid walls one is a translation that is the entire wall moves away as a rigid body, a rotation about the toe that is uh, the, uh, the retaining wall um, deforms by rotation about the toe about the bottom point then rotation about the top this is especially true for very high retaining walls. We assume that the mode of deformation is the top is fixed and then the bottom is moving and um, of course the amount of deformation also depends on the height of the retaining wall. And coupled to this we could also 
say the flexibility of the retaining wall also controls the, uh, the um, deformations that we require. And just to illustrate, I am presenting some results from finite element analysis um, on uh, how much deformation do we require. And uh, this particular result is generated for a soil with a friction angle of 40 degrees and a C of 0 and for two different soils, one with a constant Young's modulus of 25,000 and another with 50,000. And we see that the soil with um, a higher um, uh, modulus, it undergoes larger uh, stress changes for the same amount of deformation. On the x axis, we have the, uh, the percentage of the deformation as a, as a function of the height of the wall. Then on the y axis, we have the lateral earth pressure coefficient that is just simply the uh, the integral of sigma x dx that is the net sum of the lateral forces divided by 1 half gamma h square uh, to define the k. And the initial um, earth pressure constant was fairly high, um, very near to 0.7. And then as the wall is deformed away, the earth pressure comes down to active state and for um, 40 degrees, it is um, it's nearly 0 0.1, um, I think nearly 0 0.19 or something. And we see that in both the cases, the earth pressure comes down at some deformation. Uh, for soil with a Young's modulus of 50,000, we require about 0 0.2 percent of the wall deformation, whereas for soil with 25,000, we may require a wall deformation as much as 0 0.5 percent of the wall height. And uh, this is uh, the data for three different friction angles, all with the same Young's modulus of 25,000. We have the data for 50 degrees, 40 degrees and 30 degrees. And uh, we see that uh, the soil with uh, 30 degrees, it reaches the active state at, um, at a deformation of about 0.3 percent of the wall height. Then uh, the soil with 40 degrees may be at about uh, 0 0.5 percent wall height. Then 50 degrees, it requires much larger um, deformation about 0 0.6 percent of the, of the wall height. Um, so, we see that the amount of deformation that we require depends on the soil properties, the shear strength and then the modulus. Then it also depends on the, the mode of deformation. The usually the translational um, um, mode of deformation results in quicker um, uh, reduction of the pressures, whereas um, the rotation about the bottom, uh, sorry, the rotation about the top, it requires very large amount of uh, deformation, whereas the rotation about the bottom, it requires um, somewhat in intermediate um, type of uh, deformation. So the, if you want to. Um, design a system that will um, um, that will allow the soil to deform uh, to reduce that pressures. We need to somehow uh, design a system that will um, allow about um, say about 0.3 percent of the wall height so that that pressures are reduced. And now let's look at the rigid walls. See in the case of rigid walls there is no possibility for lateral deformation and, uh, and because of that we cannot generate active earth pressures. The earth pressures are usually very high and some examples of these um, uh, rigid walls are the basement walls that we have uh, below the ground level and then bridge abutments, tunnel walls and uh, so on. And in the case of uh, bridge abutments, we usually have very strong foundation at the bottom and at the top, the bridge deck um, prevents the lateral uh, deformation. And uh, we normally use very heavy compaction um, on the approach roads leading to the, um, to the bridge, uh, bridge slab. Um, and um, the typically most of the codes, they, re they recommend using very high earth pressure constants for design of any retaining walls uh, supporting the backfill 
associated with the bridge abutments. And um, once in a such case is the IS 4651 uh, that recommends a K naught of 0.8 for design of bridge abutments. The K naught of 0.8 is very high. The normal earth pressure constant that we use are about one third to maybe maximum about 0 0.5 depending on the type of soil that we have. So, why do we need a very heavy compaction against bridge abutments? The usually the, uh, the bridge abutments uh, they are very rigid because they have a very strong foundation and sometimes with the piles and then we have the, uh, the rigid um, bridge deck and then we have the we have the, um, the approach road and um, uh, typically we experience a bump whenever um, we uh, reach the bridge um, on a very long approach road that is because the soil behind the bridge abutment is compressible whereas the bridge itself is supported on very heavy foundation. So, after the construction uh, there are no settlements within the bridge abutment, but whereas in the soil there could be some, um, some compressions uh, because of the, um, the compressibility of the soil and um, to prevent these uh, post construction settlements we use very heavy compaction usually with uh, vibro rollers and um, this in turn leads to very high compaction pressures and uh, that is uh, the reason why we have a um, some the design codes recommending very high at the pressure constants for design of bridge abutments and other uh, support structures. So, in such cases what do we do? Do we design for high pressures or can we think of some uh, mechanism so that we can reduce that pressures so as to economize our designs. Let us say that um, we have a, a very rigid uh, box culvert like this which is very rigid and if you have soil behind it will be under K naught state or um, under compaction um, pressure states. But let us imagine that we have a vertical layer of uh, compressible material like a sponge. Just imagine that we have a sponge and the sponge you know that it compresses and the principle here is that uh, we as the this compressible layer is compressing the soil expands laterally and in the process it may reach the, um, the active earth pressure state. So, this is called as the controlled yielding because um, the amount of lateral deformation that we induce in the soil can be controlled by, by controlling the properties of this uh, compressible layer the thickness and then the compressible properties like the modulus and other uh, properties. So, because of that we call it as a controlled yielding uh, technique and um, as the, the compressible layer is compressing it allows the backfill soil to expand into this uh, void that is created by the compression of the vertical layer and uh, this brings in an active condition in the retained um, soil and thus the uh, amount of lateral earth pressures that we need to use for design are reduced and this in turn leads to more economical designs. In many cases depending on the choice of material that we have for the compressible layer they may uh, function um, uh, not only to reduce that pressures, but in uh, some other ways for as a thermal insulator or as a drainage layer or as a barrier against sound and heat and so on. And um, the some of the different materials that we have the um, or something like this is actually all these uh, four pictures um, that we have already seen earlier under uh, the different types of geosynthetics. Basically these are all um, different types of drainage mediums and um, these uh, drainage mediums uh, they have compressibility and that compressibility we can exploit for um, inducing uh, lateral strains within the soil and uh, these two are um, uh, the uh, the two pictures oops, 
these two pictures that we have they are the drainage mediums and this is also a drainage medium but it is made of um, um, the rubber tires and other things they are glued together and here we have the expanded polystyrene beads which are all bonded together uh, loosely and this can also act as a drainage medium come uh, compressible medium and the different types of um, compressible materials that we can use they are uh, corrugated cardboard sheets. Just imagine you have a um, very thick cardboard sheet um, that is placed against the basement wall during the construction. After the construction is over you pour some water into it and uh, in the presence of water the cardboard just simply um, uh, becomes um, flexible and then the entire thing uh, compresses a uh, removable plywood sheets. We put in the plywoods which are pulled out after the construction is over at uh, the geo drains like this the fiberglass wool then rock wool and then the geoforms there are different types of geoform one simple example is, um, is this then uh, this is also you can think of um, a, a foam material that allows for drainage and also the compression. So some of the requirements for this uh, compressible material are uh, shown here. So this material it should be compressible enough initially with a low stiffness and then once it compresses and once the soil expands uh, this material should not further uh, compress because if it goes on compressing the soil will yield too much and then uh, we may have some problems with the surface settlements happening if uh, so the stiffness should increase beyond a certain um, strain level so that um, the soil will not undergo uncontrolled deformations and the material should be durable even in the presence of water. So whatever material that we provide there um, it should be able to, um, to withstand the effect of water and um, it is preferable if this compressible layer can also serve as a drainage medium or an insulating medium or uh, for some other things so that it is um, it serves as a, as a uh, in for multiple purposes. One example applications of this was uh, published by Pathos and Kazanivsky in 1987. They were um, dealing with the design of a, of a um, subway tunnel in the city of Philadelphia and um, this um, is actually the plan view is shown here and um, the sectional view is shown here. There is a height difference uh, for the subway um, from the left side to the right side and one side we have the market street. The top is at uh, the road um, elevation is 7.6 meters and the right side uh, the JFK boulevard is at a height of uh, 9.8 meters. So there is about 2.2 meters of um, height difference and um, that obviously generates um, very large differential earth pressures and then the overturning moments and um, in order to achieve the economy in design what they proposed to do is uh, they wanted to reduce the earth pressures on this side by several means and um, is actually the soil I will show what are the different methods uh, that they thought about a bit later but uh, this is the typical uh, soil profile uh, that is there at the site. And they estimated that for the particular uh, soil um, uh, that is there at the site uh, they require about a deformation equal to 0.3 percent of the wall height uh, so that we can achieve active conditions. And they thought about uh, different alternatives um, if we are not able to achieve lateral deformations we can fill the, um, the, uh, the area with uh, lightweight cellular concrete so that uh, the, um, the lateral earth pressure themselves reduce because of the reduction in the unit weight, unit weight of the backfill material or a stabilized backfill uh, so that we increase the friction angle and the cohesion so that our earth pressures are reduced or provide tie backs like this. Um, the tie back is uh, something like this or provide uh, some drainage medium on the on the wall 
of thickness uh, 20, uh, 250 millimeters and um, the cost economics have shown that the fourth option is the most economical one because um, if we want to use the stabilized backfill we need to bring it from far off place and within a city area um, it is very difficult to operate uh, too many uh, transport trucks and um, so they went in for uh, the fourth option they provided um, 250 mm um, thick um, uh, drainage board on this side on the side with um, higher um, in um, higher elevation so that the earth pressures are reduced here and uh, these are the uh, the measured earth pressures see this um, the first one is uh, the at rest earth pressure uh, that is the theoretical earth pressure and uh, the second one is the active um, earth pressures and the third one is the is the measured earth pressures the usually in all these cases the measured earth pressures are smaller than even the active earth pressures because of the further phenomenon like uh, soil arching because the when there is a uh, the when there is a friction that is um, acting uh, between uh, two soil layers because of non uniform uh, lateral deformations that the pressures reduce that we call as the soil arching and because of that phenomenon most of the measured earth pressures are smaller than what we estimate from theoretical analysis and uh, we have done a similar uh, case study in india um, on a box culvert that was built in gujarat these uh, box culverts are part of a national highway that are running through and uh, the it is um, in order to economize on the thickness of this box culvert um, um, walls we thought we can reduce that pressures by inducing a controlled yielding and the typical um, height of these box culverts the maximum height is about uh, 5 meters they vary anywhere from about 2 to 5 meters <coughs> and um, this is um, during the construction you can see the uh, the geofoam that was placed there as a as a compressible medium and um, we can use uh, the main advantage of this method of construction is um, we don't have to change the method of construction we can use the normal construction procedures in this particular case uh, the soil was compacted in 200 millimeter layers using vibro rollers and the plate compactors and uh, the particular material the compressible material that was chosen was uh, resin bonded uh, rock wool sheets uh, these sheets are typically used as uh, um, um, the insulators for the air conditioning ducts and the unit weight or uh, the density is about 120 kg per cubic meters and these are readily available in the market um, in uh, 50 mm thick sheets with um, plan size of 1.5 meters by 1.2 meters and uh, mainly we preferred using this because they are readily available in the market and they are fairly large size which can be taken to the site and then uh, fixed to the walls and the assumed soil properties only some um, um, very rough idea was given to us because um, um, because we could not test the soil here at IIT Madras, but uh, we got the properties from the consultants. The, um, the Young's modulus was assumed as uh, 25,000 and because they have used uh, uh, granular fill, we assume that the C is 0 to be on the conservative side and the friction angle varies anywhere from 30 to 35 degrees and the unit weight was assumed as 20 kilonewtons per cubic meter because the soil was um, very highly compacted and uh, we designed the thickness of this compressible material based on some um, uh, back calculations using finite element analysis and um, the earth pressures that were generated they were measured using earth pressure cells the simple um, uh, siscon uh, pressure cells were used which have a diameter of 60 mm and a thickness of 30 mm and um, they have a capacity of 300 kPa and accuracy of 3 kPa. They were um, these earth pressure cells they were fixed along the height of the wall 
and um, they were fixed rigidly and then um, um, they were um, the outside um, uh, surface was flush with the with the retaining wall so that we do not have any other um, um, phenomena that affect the earth pressure measurements. We made sure that um, these earth pressure cells are flush with the with the um, surface. And for um, estimating the properties of the, the compressible material, um, we have to do the compression test and um, the schematic is uh, shown here. So actually, there is an ASTM standard for doing the compression test and we have followed all these um, ASTM standards and um, these, this is the data that we have for um, uh, different types of um, um, uh, different thicknesses of this material 50 mm, uh, 50 mm thick and 100 mm thick. Then uh, we also soak these um, rock wool in water because in the worst case during rainy season if the water enters the backfill it might soak up the, um, the, uh, the compressible material and um, so in order to test the properties even when the, the material is wet. Uh, the tests were done um, under soaked conditions and this is the um, this is the data that we have on the modulus because the modulus is the important parameter that goes as an input for finite element analysis. Uh, the at different normal pressures the modulus is different. It started anywhere at about uh, 50 kPa and then um, at um, pressure of 15 kPa it increased to 67. It increases rapidly and um, even at a, uh, at a normal pressure of 50 kPa the modulus is about 400 kPa which is um, high enough to prevent any undue um, lateral expansions. And um, the finite element analysis was performed by using a modified um, hyperbolic model with um, plasticity and dilation. The typical uh, stress strain equation is uh, shown here and the, the hyperbolic um, equation the tangent Young's modulus is, re is related to different parameters like this. Then the tangent Young uh, bulk modulus is related to confining pressure like this and um, we had implemented a special algorithm for taking care of the plasticity and dilation and other uh, um, standard features and, uh, and so this is the um, these are the results that we got for um, uh, this is the analysis were done for maximum height of the wall of 5 meters and once the design works for uh, for this height the uh, the similar thing can be adopted even for um, other heights and uh, these are the lateral deformations corresponding to different um, thicknesses of the compressible material the 50 mm, 100 mm, 150 mm and uh, 50 mm has the least uh, deformations whereas 150 mm has reasonably high deformations. So actually uh, the maximum wall height is 5 meters and the amount of deformation uh, that we are able to generate with about uh, 150 mm is, um, is about 9 mm uh, on the average and the result of this um, deformation is um, on the lateral earth pressures is like this. The 50 mm um, um, compressible medium could not um, deform the, on the soil uh, sufficiently and because of that the, um, the earth pressures were very high and the K naught that was used in the finite element simulations was 0.8 uh, that is to account for all the compaction induced uh, stresses and so on. And when we used um, 100 and 150 mm um, uh, thickness, the earth pressures that were uh, generated were very close to the Rankin active state. Is so actually this line corresponds to the Rankin um, active earth pressure, and um, so we, it is clear that uh, with 50 mm thick uh, compressible material, we cannot achieve active state, but with uh, 100 and 150 mm thick thickness we can achieve the active state and um, to be on the safe side we recommended 150 mm thick uh, compressible uh, material and uh, that was adopted at the site. 
and uh, the measured uh, data is something like this. Uh, this line corresponds to an earth pressure state of uh, k is equal to 0 0.8 and um, this line uh, with, uh, with um, diamond shaped um, symbols corresponds to k of one third and the earth pressures that, um, that were measured are very close to this state. Uh, this is um, this plus marks are the measured earth pressures after about one month after the construction was over. Once all the construction was over, uh, the measurements were taken and uh, there was not much of a drift. Um, even after one month, the, uh, the earth pressures did not increase any further. Uh, initially, they were very low because um, the soil was being placed and then um, later on uh, they increased. So, at some heights the earth pressures are uh, much lower than the k corresponding to one third and at, um, at bottom um, heights the earth pressures are slightly higher. But then um, the, um, the you can see the economy that we can achieve by reducing the earth pressures. So actually this is uh, corresponding to k of uh, 0.8 this is corresponding to a k of nearly um, 0.33 or 0.35. Um, so, we can um, reduce the earth pressures by a factor of at least 2 and uh, the moments also we, they are reduced by a factor of 2. Very large number of laboratory model studies were um, performed um, on this topic and here actually there is uh, some data that was uh, published by Professor McGowan and others at Strathclyde University and um, this is a finite element uh, uh, model for simulating their uh, test data. What they have done is instead of um, uh, using a compressible material, they used the springs um, that they call as soft, medium, stiff and um, hard springs. Um, to simulate the different um, uh, thicknesses of this compressible material and they had um, uh, small um, uh, facing panels which are um, supported on rollers so that they can move only horizontally and uh, they were supported by these uh, springs and then they placed this backfill and the height of these uh, walls were uh, 1 meter. Then they measured the, the deformation and the force that is developed within the springs and uh, correlated that to the uh, to the earth pressures and this is the type of uh, data um, uh, that is produced the delta by h on the x axis and uh, z by h on the y axis and um, these are the deformations um, with the depth for this um, the stiff springs they have a very small deformation of the order of 0 0.05 percent and the soft springs they have very large um, uh, large deformations and uh, the dashed line is the finite element predicted um, deformation the solid line is the the experimental data is actually the difference between the experimental and um, the finite element one is on the choice of um, the interface properties at the at the base is actually in the finite element analysis it was assumed that the, um, the ground surface was rough and because of that there is a large difference. But otherwise uh, in the top part the deformations of both uh, the measured and the finite element predicted ones are almost the same. And um, the similar uh, comparisons were made for at the pressures and so on and reasonable uh, comparisons were obtained and then the some parametric uh, finite element analysis were done to determine the uh, to come out with a thickness that will yield that will give us the active conditions for different type of soils. Uh, four different types of soils were considered with 36 degrees, 38, 42, 48 degrees um, friction angle and uh, three different wall heights 3 meters, 5 meters, 10 meters and then the thickness of um, the compressible material the T by H of 0 0.01, 0 0.025, 0 0.05, 0 0.05, 0 0.05, 0 0.01 is actually 0 0.01 corresponds to 
one percent, and then the Young's modulus of this compressible board was uh, varied from 100 kPa to 1000 kPa, and the typical results they are um, shown here. On the x-axis we have the deformation, the y-axis we have the uh, the height, the elevation for uh, this particular case, the proctor density of the soil is 80 percent, the wall height is 3 meters and the friction angle of 36 degrees with uh, 3 different thicknesses we get 3 different types of deformations and uh, the resulting earth pressures they are um, plotted like this and uh, for uh, different thicknesses. T by h of 0 0.025 that is 2.5 percent, 5 percent, 10 percent and so on. The earth pressures when um, the modulus is uh, very, very small, the earth pressures are lower than even the active earth pressures because of the soil arching phenomenon and at um, some uh, thickness and uh, modulus the K by K A is equal to 1 and that we called as the critical thickness corresponding to the uh, to the modulus that we have and if you plot all this data together in terms of the modulus and the thickness that will give us the active states the data plots like this for different uh, wall heights for 3 meter wall height 5 meter and a 10 meter wall height and um, the particular um, data um, that was um, uh, proposed by Parthos and Kazanivsky plots something like this. Their data is in this range which is very close to the data um, uh, that uh, we have um, for um, friction angle of 36 degrees and uh, 3 meters wall height which is similar to the, uh, to the one that they have. And uh, at IIT Madras, we have done lot of uh, laboratory tests to quantify the earth pressure reductions and then, um, and then see whether we can further reduce the, uh, the earth pressures and then the resulting deformations. Uh, all the tests were performed in a, a concrete uh, tank. These walls were very smooth, they were finished with a very smooth finish and then they were coated with a double layer plastic sheet and in between were sprayed some oil so that um, there is a very little um, um, wall friction that acts. The front side of this rigid wall uh, we have fixed a um, wooden plank with um, holes in them so that we can fix the earth pressure cells which are very uh, which are flush with the uh, with this wooden plank and um, at different heights the earth pressures were measured and then the deformations and the tests were all done in a very controlled manner uh, so that we can generate the data that we can uh, that we can apply for our uh, design purposes so actually these are all the electronic um, lvdt's uh, to measure the um, the deformations uh, that are taking place in the in the compressible medium and um, alternately we had the LVDTs and the pressure cells and um, the close up view uh, with um, styrofoam sheets. So actually we have used uh, different materials the styrofoam sheets and then the compressible uh, fiberglass wool as a compressible, compressible material and this particular uh, picture shows um, two layers of uh, styrofoam sheets and uh, this is the test with rock wool layer and uh, these are um, the locations for measuring the, uh, the deformations. The front of the LVDTs was connected with a, uh, with a plate uh, so that um, the, um, the earth pressure acts on these plates and then pushes them, pushes the LVDT probe to, um, to record the, the deformations. And um, this the entire um, height of the tank was uh, filled with soil with a very controlled uh, compaction property so that we can achieve the desired unit weight and then the friction angle of the soil. And um, the height of the tank is only 1.75 meters 
and in order to simulate higher height walls what we have done is we have uh, applied pressure on the entire um, soil by inflating a inflating a, um, a rubber um, a rubber tube uh, to apply the pressure and once you apply the pressure uh, we can simulate higher um, height walls so actually the additional height that we can simulate is just basically the pressure that we apply divided by the unit weight of the soil and uh, these are all the different um, equipments that were used the pressure cells having uh, capacities of 3 bar and 10 bar because we wanted to measure the pressure along the height of the wall and then along the length of the wall and electronic um, uh, pressure readout units then LVDTs and then the strain gauges to measure the strains that are developed within the reinforcement layers and then the strain gauge readout units and um, two different types of compressible materials were used one is a styrofoam um, that is typically used for packing the computers and other things and then fiberglass wool and uh, schematically uh, the sectional view is uh, shown here we have the uh, backfill soil and then uh, this blue color vertical line is the compressible material and uh, this is our rigid retaining wall and uh, we have um, the LVDTs to measure the, the compression that is happening within the uh, within this compressible material and then uh, the the pressures uh, the pressure cells that are fixed on the on the rigid uh, wall to measure the um, the um, depth pressures uh, this is another close up these are the earth pressure cells and these are the LVDT probes and these probes are connected with a steel plate so that um, um, they can um, the LVDT probe can deform and um, this is the typical uh, stress strain graph for the geoform sheets uh, the thickness of each of these uh, geoform sheet or the styrofoam sheet is uh, 24 millimeters and uh, we have done the test with confinement and without confinement that is within a retaining wall the entire thing is confined and um, so we simulated that confined test by putting them uh, within a uh, within a mold um, having a thickness of 24 millimeters so that when we apply the compression the material does not um, strain in the lateral directions in this case because uh, the material is uh, so compressible that and with a very low Poisson's ratio it did not deform very much so whether we confine this material or uh, do not confine the difference uh, between the stress strain behavior is uh, not very much different and these are the results for different uh, thicknesses 24 millimeters 48 millimeters and 72 millimeters and more or less um, they have similar uh, stress strain behavior and these are all the uh, different earth pressures that we were um, able to measure um, for different cases so the first one is uh, the earth pressures um, under self weight condition that is when the backfill was filled up to the full depth and um, is actually the depth um, the y axis we have the depth going down from the surface to the uh, to the bottom of the wall and that uh, the maximum pressure that was applied was uh, 55 kPa that is corresponding to, to this and the unit weight um, that we could achieve was 18 kilo Newtons per cubic meter so 55 kPa corresponds to 3 meters so our um, actual um, height of the wall that we were able to simulate is 3 plus 1.75 that is a 4.75 meter height of the wall and as we apply the pressures uh, the uh, depth pressures increased and this particular data is for a case where there is no compressible material there is a rigid wall and the backfill soil and then we apply the pressure and then uh, these are the depth pressures that were generated the maximum earth pressure that is generated was about 27 kPa at uh, 55 kPa at, mm, uh, pressure and uh, these are the uh, the results with 
uh, different thicknesses of the styrofoam uh, this uh, this one is corresponding to uh, no compressible material this is with 24 millimeters this is with 48 and this is with 72 millimeters thick and the earth pressures uh, the maximum earth pressures are reduced from about uh, 27 uh, 26 k 26 kpa to about uh, 16 kpa by providing um, the providing this compressible material and uh, these are the different um, earth, um, earth pressures uh, for the case of the self weight is once again without any compressible material with 24 millimeters 48 and 72 millimeters thick uh, layers and um, this is um, um, for the case of 50 kPa pressure and we have done some tests by putting in horizontal layers of uh, reinforcement to see whether the earth pressures can be further reduced and uh, this is the uh, these um, the data with um, reinforcement is actually with um, 50 mm thick um, glass wool um, and when there is no reinforcement these are death pressures that were generated and um, by putting in three layers of reinforcement death pressures have reduced drastically uh, to about this much and with 100 mm um, glass wool death pressures have uh, reduced even further. So, this uh, the uh, this data shows that we can use uh, horizontal layers of reinforcement and these uh, reinforcements are not connected to the front face and they are just simply placed within the within the backfill soil and even then they were able to uh, take the lateral strain that is generated in the soil and uh, prevent the, uh, the earth pressure from um, getting transferred into the into the rigid uh, structure and this is the data for uh, a 50 kPa surcharge pressure and this is another data for um, for the same thing for um, unreinforced and reinforced and this is the um, the compression data the maximum compression that was generated was about of the order of uh, 60 millimeters for the case of 100 mm thick um, unreinforced um, uh, fiberglass wool and uh, when the same thing was uh, reinforced the deformations were slightly lesser and um, the sum tests were performed by uh, repeatedly applying the pressure because uh, the concern is when we apply single load whether it will um, whether it will uh, represent the real life scenario where the the pressures are repeatedly applied like for example in a in a road the in the traffic um, repeats itself and um, in order to simulate that case we have done some tests by um, by applying a repeated loads up to five cycles this is the first um, um, pressure application the second third fourth fifth and so on the sorry the, the this is the initial um, pressure the first repetition second repetition third fourth and fifth repetition and uh, after certain number of cycles that pressures have become more or less constant and uh, the initial maximum earth pressure was about let us say 6 kPa here and it has increased about 8 kPa after uh, load repetitions and when the same earth pressures when uh, three layers of reinforcement were placed they have reduced to almost half 50 percent and uh, these are um, this is the same data for uh, fiberglass wool and um, this is the data with 100 mm thick um, uh, fiberglass wool and then what happens to the stiffness of the backfill soil and that we were able to get an estimate by measuring the surface uh, deformations and um, we plotted uh, the vertical uh, surface deformations along the length these dashed lines uh, with the plus symbols uh, without any reinforcement uh, for five load repetitions and with um, uh, geo grid reinforcement the, the settlements have reduced 
from about 8 millimeters to 4 millimeters and um, the similar data um, for um, for another case for the first load um, is um, is this see under the first load application without any reinforcement uh, these are these are the settlements and after five load repetitions uh, this is their the settlements and um, the uh, this one is with uh, reinforced one is actually this um, when the system is reinforced the effect of load repetitions uh, was not very much there was um, there was not much change in the in the settlements but when we have unreinforced one there was a significant um, deformations and that shows that by placing the reinforcement we can not only reduce death pressures but also increase the stiffness that is uh, that is very much required for the bridge abutments because uh, we don't want any post construction settlements that are ta that take place within the backfill soil so just to conclude the control yielding technique can be used successfully for reducing death pressures and uh, the reduced death pressures are uh, lesser than the active earth pressures because of internal arching uh, that takes place within the soil and uh, the placement of reinforcement layers further reduce death pressures. So, this uh, the entire concept of uh, controlled yielding is possible because of advanced uh, geosynthetic materials that we have uh, that uh, enable uh, this technique to be applied. Okay. Thank you very much. So, if you have questions you can contact me at this email address. Thank you.